So I'm going to talk about two projects, and I'm going to try to contrast drug discovery and chemical biology, because in my mind, even though the skill sets and technologies are the same, the, the really philosophy behind the two are different and complementary, so I want to talk about each of those. So in terms of an outline, I'm going to say, you know, why did I decide to go into academic drug discovery after spending 20 years at GSK? Because when I left graduate school, I was convinced the best place to do drug discovery was industry. They had all the know-how, all the resources. Uh, academics formed the foundational knowledge for drug discovery, but the turning it into practice was something that was done best in industry. I've changed my mind a bit over the years. So then I'm going to talk about a drug discovery project around the myrrh tyrosine kinase and talk about our chemical biology program focused on methyl lysine as a post-translational modification. So I have to do a little conflict of interest statement. So for the myrrh kinase program, uh, we have started a company around this because we've gotten to the point that to get a compound at the clinic, we have to raise money outside of uh, the federal government's funding. And Shelley Earp, Doug Graham, and I are founders of that of that company. So what can be done better in academia than in industry? And so my industrial experience was all, all at Glaxo, Glaxo Welcome, and Glaxo Smith Klein. So I can't say that this applies to everywhere, but I think that maybe some of it does. So of course, drug discovery in the simplest form is to connect a target with efficacy of treating disease in humans. And for most of the last 20 to 30 years, that target selection has been at the molecular target level. The, I mean, the molecular biology revolution drove us into this rational approach to selecting specific, typically protein targets for drug discovery. And the challenge with this has become an industry as the um, sort of finance guys took over R&D is that this, in, this model has become a very linear process with little patience for deviation from this connection. In other words, I pick a target, I think this is going to treat type 2 diabetes, I start the program. Anytime I get the notion it might not be useful treat, for treating type 2 diabetes, I quit and I start over. And you get people saying it's good to have this sort of fail fast, fail cheap mentality. And one of the challenges is that actually, if the target's role in human disease is unprecedented, meaning there's not a drug ahead of you in the clinic that's proven this is a useful target, this very rarely works. It's less than a 10% success rate. And I can tell you, people throw stones in industry for not being innovative enough. GSK's pipeline was hugely innovative. Most of the early targets that went into phase one trials were these unprecedented targets. And guess what happened to them? Somehow this connection did not get made to actually having a compound that met their expectations. And of course the problem with the fail fast, fail cheap mentality is that if you've actually, I mean some of you are students, so you're four or five, maybe two or three years into your research career. Um, some of us have been at this for 30 or more years. And if you think of that sort of probability of success as time passes on a research project, does it look like this? You know, each Friday, have you taken that one step closer to proving your hypothesis that it's always a linear progression towards success? Well, unfortunately, the projects I've worked on don't look like that. Actually, the good ones look something like this. So there are months and years where you're going backwards, like this is, looks like it's never going to work. And then for a while, it's going to work, and you go back and forth, and that's what a good one looks like. So if you have a committee of dispassionate individuals reviewing your progress every month, and they have a fell fast, fell cheap mentality, guess what happens? You actually never get to make anything successful. And I think that that is a fundamental flaw in having uh, a short-term focus in, terms, in, in research. And drug discovery is research. It's not, it's not just application of technology. So what do I think we can do better in academia? I think it's, this box is sort of where I would tend to focus my attention. If we have a target that we're interested in and biological approaches to that, and then as a chemist, my job is to get small molecule tools to enhance understanding that target and target validation. And we go around this loop between chemistry and biology. And in this box, you can do a lot of important science. And occasionally, you will do science that connects that target to treating disease in humans. It won't always happen. But it will never happen if you don't persist. You cannot change your mind every five minutes about whether or not you're committed to something. You really have to stick with it. So my criteria for biological collaborators is not whether or not I think they're right. It's whether or not they're a solid scientist and they're committed to the hypothesis they want to test. And so if we do this and we know that drug discovery is not 
a process. It's not simply application of technologies. Let's string together assay development, high throughput screening, medicinal chemistry. Um, it's actually research, and, and you go around the circle learning things. And in industry, in my set of 20 years, at GSK K at least, merger and acquisition activities have essentially destroyed many pharma groups and undermined incentives for a long-term perspective in industry. So everybody wants a quick, you know, quick connection to efficacy in humans, and that's just not, I don't think it's gonna happen. I don't think there's a new technology that's gonna break down the paradigm of chemists working closely with biologists for over a number of years to understand a novel target. So that's my little soapbox for why I moved to UNC. And one of the things I did when I got to UNC was start collaborating with Shelley Earp, who's the director of the Cancer Center. And Shelley's had a lifelong interest in the myrrh tyrosine kinase. And uh, it was cloned in his lab in the late 1990s. And we've been working with Shelley and one of his former students, Doug Graham, who's at the University of Colorado for the last four years. So I came to UNC saying I would never work on a protein kinase target. I started a protein kinase department at GSK. Their pisopinib and lapatinib were discovered in that project, product in that department. So two FDA approved drugs were discovered there and I was ready to do something different. But the thing is when you work in oncology, kinases are validated targets often implicated in the disease and they're chemically tractable. So you really, you actually shouldn't ignore them just because you'd like to do something new. Um, so the myrrh tyrosine kinase is one of the more recently evolved tyrosine kinases. It sits on the surface of the cell. It's expressed in macrophages, epithelial tissues, and reproductive tissues. Its major physiologic role is in the macrophage, and it functions as a fossil tidal serine responsive receptor. So where does fossil tidal serine show up? It shows up when cells undergo apoptosis, the cellular membrane is flipped, exposing fossil tidal serine, and those cells also release um, a protein called GAS6 that binds between fossil tidal serine and GAS6. That's the ligand from the myrrh tyrosine kinase receptor. And what it does in the macrophage is when cells undergo apoptosis and macrophages come along to clean them up, you do not want them to mount an immune response. So this turns macrophages into wound healing uh, cells that are just cleaning up apoptotic material and not mounting a cytokine response to that dead tissue. So that's its normal role, but it's aberrantly expressed in a number of tumors. So in leukemia, both ALL and AML, and many solid tumors, this pathway is turned on as a survival signal. So it's on in the cancer cell itself. It's also turned on and utilized in the tumor-associated macrophages. So tumor-associated macrophages, the problem with them is they are not mounting an immune response to the tumor. So they are generating a wound healing supportive environment for the tumor to grow. So MER then, as I'll go on to say several times, is a dual target in oncology, both against tumor cells that overexpress MER or ectopically express MER and in the tumor-associated macrophage. And I have, we have some data I'll show you that both of those types of activities can lead to um, anti-tumor function. So this is sort of a slide that just says what I just said. So MERS overexpressed in certain tumor cells. That's a survival signal. It's not a strong growth factor receptor, so it doesn't drive proliferation. It drives survival and prevention of apoptosis. And it's also highly expressed in tumor-associated macrophages. So we thought this makes MER a great target for as an anti-cancer agent and potentially to have this dual effect. And if you're following the oncology area at all, you know that after kind of 30 years of scoffing at immune therapeutic approaches to cancer, there, people actually have compounds, uh, anti-PD-1, et cetera, that are showing prolonged regressions in certain tumor types in humans. So Im immunology is really a hot area at the moment, and we think this could hopefully be part of it. So how did we get started? So uh, we didn't run a high throughput screen. There was a crystal structure for the myrrh tyrosine kinase and complex with this compound 52 that was about a, a 10 micromolar inhibitor of the kinase. So using that crystal structure, we designed a series of potential ligands. <laughs> And we made those compounds, and, and actually when we um, determined their co-crystal structure with MER, they bound completely differently than what we had modeled. So in this compound, this is a donor acceptor pair that binds to the hinge region of the protein kinase, so this is ATP competitive, binding where ATP binds. 
But our small molecule, when we designed these, it actually flips over, and this is a parafluorophenyl group that is coming out toward the solvent front. So the bonding mode wasn't exactly what we predicted computationally, but the thing I've learned over many years using computational chemistry, it's, it's, the point isn't whether it's right or wrong, it's an idea generator, and you figure out if it's right or wrong by making the compounds and testing them. So it's not a, it's not a deductive process, it's just it's very much an idea generation process, which we use in kind of all our projects. Um, so how have we done on this time scale? I'm not going to kind of drag you through the MedChem story. I'm just going to highlight a few compounds and then talk about where we are in terms of in vivo activity with compounds. So we're looking back at our kind of probability of success with time. So we started with that uh, crystal structure that was published, and we determined some of our own structures. And after about a year and a half with a couple of chemists, we had a good, in, what we thought was a good in vivo tool compound. So three nanomolar IC50 against myrrh. The other two members of this receptor class are Axel and Tyro3. We're sort of tenfold selective against those two close relatives. This compound has good mouse PK. Unfortunately, it has strong activity at the herd cardiac ion channel. And um, Dr. Silverman and other medicinal chemists in the audience will look at that and say, well, you've got this lipophilic molecule with a basic amine hanging off of this. That's, that's where the herd's coming from, and that's, that's true. Um, but with this compound, we had good solubility, decent cellular activity, but unfortunately, when we went into AML and AL models in mice, we showed no survival advantage over saline. So this compound wasn't good enough, but it was, a, it was our start. So we dialed out HERG by replacing this uh, amino group with an alcohol that can also function in the same way in terms of bonding in the receptor. Um, this compound has sort of moderate PK, crummy solubility, but no HERG activity. We figured out where we could put the basic amine back to regain solubility. And now this is the compound I'm going to talk about for the next 10 minutes or so, UNC 2025, where it has good or really great mouse PK. I'll show you that data. Uh, two nanomolar in the cell against MER. Uh, very low HERG activity, so we don't get a curve in Patch Express up to 100 micromolars, so we got rid of that problem, and we now have good in vivo efficacy. So a lesson for academic drug discovery would be, um, you know, kinases are a precedented target class. Many issues are understood, but this took us like two and a half years, uh, three to five chemists, hundreds of compounds to actually go from here to here. So one hypothesis is that we're hacks and that this shouldn't have taken so long. The hypothesis I prefer is that, that drug discovery is this iterative process of figuring out. If you're not a chemist, you might look and say these are practically the same molecule, but they're, these little changes we made are exactly what makes the difference between a compound that does not work in vivo and one that has great in vivo activity. So the challenge in an academic setting is how do you, how do you fund this activity? There are not going to be many science papers about how we optimize that. So I think that's something you have to be realistic about. Um, so here's UNC 2025. It's got really nice physical properties. One of my goals uh, was to prove you could make a kinase inhibitor that was totally soluble. One of the big challenges in uh, the clinic is many kinase inhibitors have highly variable PK, strong interaction with P450s, insolubility. This is freely soluble in saline, like 300 micromolar concentrations. Um, very potent against MERS. So 160 picomolar, we have to determine its activity with quantitative enzymology by the method of Morrison. Uh, but an activity that we are carrying along is activity against the FLT3 tyrosine kinase. And we've, we've stuck with that in this lead series because in AML, which is one of the cancers we want to treat, FLT3 is also very important. We're selective towards Axel Tyro3 that I've mentioned, some selectivity there, not active against HERD. But of course, when we go and profile this against the kinome, like all other kinase inhibitors, we pick up a number of other kinases that we inhibit. So the question is, does how do these other kinases matter? When do they matter? So we know that the Carna IC50s underestimate the potency because we're simply titrating the enzyme in this assay. So we're a little more selective than these numbers would suggest. And the case I'm going to try to make is that Axel, which is, uh, we're kind of, you can see the difference, 17 nanomolar, about, you know, 100 fold here, but less in Karna, we're going to use Axel as our sentinel for off-target kinase activity. Because the big bugaboo in kinase inhibitors is selectivity, and right, you know, rightfully so. There's 500 in the kinome. Most small molecule inhibitors are ATP competitive. You're binding to a conserved site. 
So you know you're going to have kind of a profile. So selectivity, and, and, and I'm going to say this is it's probably more important in chemical biology than drug discovery. In drug discovery, you care if things are safe and efficacious. But another thing that you care about is you'd like to know what hypothesis you're testing when you go into humans. And if you don't understand which targets you're interacting with, you don't know the hypothesis you're testing. So that's the most important issue to me for selectivity in drug discovery. A secondary issue is will off-target activity compromise safety and the developability of the compound? Well, this is great, and people will debate forever whether or not hitting those other kinases is toxic, but in reality, we rarely know what the anti-targets are. So I've mentioned some of them. We don't want to hit the cardiac ion channel. Uh, 5H2D2B agonism causes valvulopathy. You'd rather not interact with P450. There's a limited list of molecular targets where it's really, really bad to inhibit them. But it is true that some multi-kinase inhibitors are quite toxic, so we take it seriously, you know, kind of understanding our profile. So the first place where I'm really more serious about understanding selectivity is in cells. So when you go into the cell and you're ATP competitive, there's high intracellular concentrations of ATP, and your dose response curve will always move to the right. So this is a dose response against phosphomer. So mer dimerizes, autophosphorylates itself, and we can measure the effect of the compound on inhibition of autophosphorylation of the mer tyrosine kinase. And we have about a 2.5 nanomolar IC50 in the cellular assay. So we've moved from 160 picomolar to 2.6 nanomolar. That's kind of a 10 to 20 fold rightward shift, which is sort of expected. If we look at the two other members of the tyro axomer family, what we can see is that this axle activity actually moves us. So if we look at the mer phosphomer, at 50 nanomolar, we're substantially inhibiting the level of phosphomer. We have to get to 500 nanomolar to substantially inhibit the level of axle, phosphoaxle. So I would argue from these two data points that our axle curve has also moved to the right and that if that relationship holds for all those other kinases that we also tweak, our in vivo effects will be dominated by our picomolar activity at MER and FLT3. So that's what we, we continue to believe as we're going toward the clinic, is that uh, the compound's major pharmacology is going to come from these two protein kinases. One of the other ways that we've looked at this, and this is, I should have said up front that this is project is funded. Um, Jim Dorshaw, I think, was one of the speakers at this symposium a few years ago. So Jim's group, the new experimental therapeutics group at the NCR, has funded this project to this stage. And one of the experiments they did at SAIC Frederick was use this footprinting technique. So this is an activity-based probe for protein kinases. So you can take a mixed anhydride of ATP or ADP and use that to label the catalytic lysine in the kinase active site. So that will lead to, if you don't treat with inhibitor, you can see which kinases can I label in this cellular system with this biotin tagged version um, of ATP or ADP. And then you simply repeat the, the experiment in the presence of your inhibitor and say, which kinases did I protect? And in this case, we're 50 picomolar in terms of protecting MER tyrosine kinase, and that is the most potent kinase that comes up in this assay. So this is sort of an unbiased, when you send it off to Karna, it's a bunch of in vitro assays. This is going into a cell and saying, which kinase do I hit the hardest? And we were delighted to say, see that it was, that MER was that kinase. There are things we don't understand about all of this data. So FLT3 is in these cells, and we don't protect it, even though we're quite potent against it. And the NCI was comfortable that this confirms that we at least, mer tyrosine kinase is the major target of um, this compound. So in terms of, you know, why do we inhibit FLT3, it's interesting to look at the, this is just an overlay of axyl tyro 3 and FLT3, the overall structure of the protein kinases. This is where our small molecules bind in the ATP bonding site. And these are labeled with side chains where they differ from mer. So, right, if MER was up here, we wouldn't have any side chains. So, so you can see that actually Axel and Tyro 3, within everything that contacts the inhibitor, they are the same. So our selectivity in the, against these enzymes is coming from the differences in the second layer of amino acids around the active site. And what's kind of amazing is that we're a dual inhibitor of FLT3 where almost every amino acid is different. 
So we, and we stumbled into this. We weren't trying to inhibit FLT3, it's just our best compounds ended up doing that. Um, but we've now used this information to develop compounds I'm not gonna talk about that are now you know, low nanomolar against myrrh and hundreds of fold selective against Axel. Tyro 3 and FLT3, so we will have chemical tools and, and perhaps drugs that are, are much more selective than our current leads, but those aren't quite at the stage to chat about yet. In terms of mouse pharmacokinetics, I said that we had good pharmacokinetics, so clearance is a key thing that you look at as a medicinal chemist when you dose IV. This is about 10% liver blood flow clearance in, in the mouse, so that's quite a good number. 100% oral bioavailability, so the IV and PO curves overlay exactly with the compound. It's not quite dose linear as we go up to higher doses, but we do get a dose proportional increase in exposure. So we spent you know, the last year and a half of the project was fixing the PK. And the only way I know how to do that is test a lot of compounds in PK and figure out what, what, is, what are the features that, that improve the problem. Um, so with this compound, then, we've now gone into pharmacodynamic models. The next question to ask would be, if I toss the compound in the mouth of a rodent and I look in bone marrow, do I inhibit phosphomer? And this is a very challenging assay carried out in Doug Graham's lab by his research associate, Deb DeRiker where she doses the animals, sacrifices and flushes the bone marrow and immediately measures phosphomer, which is a really, really difficult thing to do because this, this, this phosphoform of myrrh is highly unstable and rapidly dephosphorylated by phosphatases. But what we could see that was if we look half an hour after treatment, three mg per kg uh, greatly inhibits the phosphorylation of myrrh. And this is in uh, bone marrow leukemia cells. And you can do enough experiments so that you can do a dose response. And as we look out at longer time points, what we see is we have to dose with larger amounts of compound to totally inhibit phosphomer. And if we want 24-hour coverage of phosphomer, we need to be in the 50 to 75 milligram range. So this has been our pharmacodynamic assay to show we're engaging the target in vivo. And from that, we've gone into in vivo efficacy studies. And this is the model where I mentioned a year and a half into the project, we had a compound that was three nanomolar and it did nothing in this model. Uh, so it's a model of a very aggressive tumor. So this is a xenograft of an acute lymphoblastic leukemia line called the 697 line. And these are mice, um, immunocompromised mice that are engrafted with a leukemia line that has also been transfected with luciferase. So the way that you can measure disease development in the mice is to dose them IP with luciferin and then image them just to count um, how luminescent is the mouse, tells you where the tumor is and how it's growing. So starting on day 12, we start dosing these animals. On day 12, I'm not showing the data, but all the mice, if you turn up the gain, <laughs> you'll see that leukemia is present in all the mice. Um, in the saline treated mice, all the mice are dead by 30 days. So leukemia is very rapidly developing and all the mice are gone. Uh, our compound uh, doubles survival in this model, and this is a very aggressive model, so we felt this was good evidence of in vivo efficacy for the compounds. Um, and just to come back to kind of the target validation selectivity issue, if you, if you use an shRNA to knock down MER in this ALL models, you get similar effects. So if you knock MER down, you'll get about a doubling in survival. So other pathways take over and, and the mice actually succumb to the disease eventually. So that's our activity in ALL and that's a direct activity on the tumor expressing MER. We also have looked in uh, AML because AML expresses both MER and FLT3 and those are the two kinases we inhibit kind of at the peak molar level. So these are cell lines that highly express MER, and this is just a measure of apoptosis in these cell lines. And we can see as we get toward 300 nanomolar treatment with the compound, we get significant apoptosis in these cell cultures uh, due to MER activity. If we go into lines that, potent, that express FLT3, we get similar increases in apoptosis as we treat with a small molecule. And I won't describe all the downstream signaling is kind of shown on the left-hand side of the slide. When we go into an in vivo model of AML, we get profound regressions. So this model is a, was from a patient uh, xenograft, so Doug 
Graham's a pediatric oncologist at University of Colorado. He takes samples from patients and they store those. They've never been grown on plastic, never been grown in a mouse. You can engraft those tumors into mice and then ask the question, does our MRFLT3 inhibitor uh, do anything to these patient samples? And in this case, the saline control animals are dead within kind of 25 days. But if we treat with either 50 or 75 milligrams of UNC 2025, we get a complete regression of the disease. If you remove the drug on day 57, you'll see that the disease comes back. And we're now looking at ways to combine this with the chemotherapeutic agents where it will certainly be used in combination with to see if we actually can cure the mice of the AML. And because both MER and FLT3 are important in AML, uh, we think this is going to be the key sort of path to the clinic for these compounds. There are FLT3 inhibitors available, um, but the problem with them is that you get resistance in humans like five weeks after dosing. You can get regressions. Five weeks later, mutations have occurred in the kinase that cause them to be resistant to the compounds. And we've already tested UNC 2025 against some of the resistant ver versions of FLT3, and we so far are very potent against the, um, most of the resistant mutants. So the other area that we've been interested in, and I'll wrap up this sort of section of the talk, is this effect of MER in the macrophage. So to do this, you, have, you can't do xenografts because those mice don't have a competent immune system. You have to go into syngenetic models, and we've looked in breast melanoma and non-small small lung carcinoma. And I'll just show one example. So in a breast tumor that expresses a P, um, so a T antigen driven breast tumor that expresses no MER tyrosine kinase, uh, we do have good activity at 50 mg per kg in decreasing the growth rate of that tumor, which we've shown is due to turning the macrophages into developing an immune response to the tumor in these mice. We have data in melanoma that we're in the middle of uh, sort of repeating that also shows uh, regressions in melanoma, again in melanomas that don't express MER. So we think this immune component to the activity of the compounds will be very promising, but this is the place where as a chemist I'd really like to have a MER specific compound. There is no rationale for hitting FLT3 if you're trying to activate the macrophage. Macrophages don't express FLT3. So we really want to have a more selective compound for that, and we're working on it. So that's kind of the drug discovery part of the, of the um, talk, and we think we're maybe a year from an IND for this series. Um, so now I'm going to kind of pause for a minute and actually see if there are any, any questions about the first half of the talk before I jump into chemical biology of chromatin. Richard. So, the big problem when we have an academic uh, drug discovery is getting all those ADME and PK results. And it seemed like that was no problem for you. You just get as many, and it's very expensive. Yeah, it is. Do you have a, a core at UNC that does that, or where do you get your money uh, Unfortunately, we don't. And, and the truth is that the NCI would not even do these studies. So, you know, the NCI project leader, who's a toxicologist, a great person in many ways, but she she wanted to argue about every compound and we wanted to send to PK. So because I have some infrastructure support from UNC, I just spent my own money to get the PK. Uh, and so we did, you know, 12, maybe 15 compounds in six months and we solved the problem. And it was maybe $3,000 a pop for IV cross PO mouse PK. 3000 3000 I'm, yeah. I'm spending six to seven. Where were you going? Um, uh, uh, CRO in India. Where? In India. SAI. They really do a really yeah, good job. They have SAI and yeah. the university wouldn't let us. Yeah, that's sort of a problem. Yeah. I know. And it's a big problem. NIH yeah. wouldn't let us. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we actually are trying to identify a U.S.-based PK group to do our future studies with because we're really not supposed to do it there either. Um, <laughs> And we have an internal GLP DP and DMPK group, but they have not adjusted to the like, research DMPK. But that would be, it is a big bottleneck, and you just have to have the data. You can't reason your way to solve these problems. It's not, it's not deductive, it's experimental. Other kind of questions on part one? And I'm happy to take questions on part one later if they come to you. But now we'll move away from my nature photos to, um, Part two, chemical biology of chromatin regulation. And given the time, I'm probably gonna go through some of this pretty quickly, but one of the things I mentioned that, you know, I didn't really wanna work on protein kinases at UNC because I'd done it before, but nevertheless. 
so one of the things I wanted to do was work in a completely new area for me. And as I was um, constantly reading the literature, one of the areas that became very interesting to me was uh, the idea of chromatin regulation and the fact that, so, you know, your DNA is two meters long, about my height, fits in the nucleus of the cell. It's highly compacted, and actually the way it's compacted is by being wrapped. The primary structure is wrapping the DNA around a nucleosome. And the nucleosome isn't an innocent bystander packaging mechanism for this. It's actually a central element of signaling that controls uh, gene expression. And that happens by post-translational modifications to the tails of the histone proteins that are unstructured and hang out in solution. So they get phosphorylated, ubiquitinated, lysine acetylated, lysine methylated, arginine methylated. All of these things make up what has been coined the histone code. So this series of modifications recruit specific proteins to the histones that control the epigenetic fate of cells. So if you, you should ask yourself, how do I have one genome and 200 or more cell types? They all have the same genome, they're different cells, and liver cells stay liver cells because of the modification, because I should say, the key transcription factors that are expressed in liver cells and the modification state of chromatin in liver cells. Likewise in neurons, they don't get confused and become liver cells, and it's because of how the DNA is packaged. And it's this chemical post-translational modifications that organize a lot of that. And the proteins that do that, the protein lysine methyltransferases, protein lysine demethylases, are druggable targets. So this was a place where six, seven years ago, very little medicinal chemistry had been done. There were hundreds of X-ray structures of these proteins. So I decided let's focus on methyl lysine as a post-translational modification. And Jan Jin, who's a faculty a member in my center, is focused on protein lysine methyltransferases. And my group is focused on the reader domains of methyl lysine. So the reason these post-translational modifications have an effect on chromatin is they are recruiting protein complexes that recognize these modifications. And I'm going to talk the rest of the time about these um, methyl lysine binding domains. So why are, when and why are these important in disease? So many, many of these methyl lysine readers are implicated in cancer. So this is a paper from uh, Greg Wong's lab, who now has moved from David Alice, a postdoc with David Alice, to be a professor at UNC, where a PhD finger that binds trimethylated H3, histone 3, lysine 4, when it's trimethylated, it binds to this PhD domain. And when that forms a fusion protein with nucleoporin 98, that is the cause of certain hematopoietic malignancies. And if you go through the TCGA data, many, many of these epigenetic readers show up as fusion proteins in cancer. So, there's a, so the era of oncogenes all being protein kinases and a few other things like RAS is passing and the epigenetic regulation has become sort of a really, really important new area for cancer drug discovery. So in terms of methyl lysine readers, they come in many flavors. There are more than 200 domains in the human genome that recognize the methylation state of lysine. And they're structurally diverse, so they're all form and there's always an aromatic cage that recognizes the methyl lysine through a chi, uh, pi cation interaction. But some of them also, like this PhD finger, is recognizing adjacent residues. So here's an arginine that's bound next to a trimethylated lysine that's binding. Some bind, like many proteases, a long extended form of their histone substrate. So this one is probably one of the less druggable ones, I think, looking at it. Um, so there's a lot of structural variety. So when I looked at these six years ago as I was thinking of what to do, I said, well, these are functionally conserved, structurally diverse, there are no potent small molecule ligands for any of these. Nobody had done the first bit of medicinal chemistry. And I thought, well, I can go, you could probably go from zero to somewhere <laughs> more easily than you can go from like 50 years of kinase research to the next kinase drug. So let's go from zero to somewhere was my goal. Um, so we focused on MBT domains because this was the domain, it was a small set of proteins so we could actually screen most of them. And methylated lysine, mono or dimethyl the lysine fit like a plug in a socket. So the side chain was completely buried in the protein. It wasn't open to solvent like some of these other ones. So there are nine MBT containing domains in the human genome. This little blue Pac-Man is the MBT domain. They always occur as repeats. And even though they occur as repeats, only one of them is the cognate reader for mono and dimethyl lysine. So when people have a crystal structure of some of these, and a couple of these, we're the group that 
provided that crystal structure. The methylated lysine is binding in only one of those pockets. The other ones are not methyl lysine bonding pockets, but they're conserved and, and they do something else. Like most other chromatin regulated proteins as well, they are multifunctional. So they have zinc fingers that bind RNA and DNA. They have other domains of unknown function. And then many of them have a, a sterile alpha motif that's an oligomerization domain. So in terms of ligand design, I mentioned sort of this aromatic cage that recognizes methyl lysine. So if you think about the difference, so acetylation of lysine is a big chemical change, right? You lose the positive charge, you gain a new functionality to interact with. Methylation is pretty subtle. You're going from a small, hard positive charge to just a larger, more diffuse charge. And the way nature picks that up, and every enzyme that does this is building an aromatic cage where you get a, a strong, quadrupole interaction actually between the diffusible positive charge and these electron rich aromatic groups. In MBT domains there's always an aspartic acid that also hydrogen bonds and you'll see we often mutate this aspartic acid to kill the function of the pocket. If you take out that aspartic acid you block all binding. The other thing from this slide you should see is that the first structure paper said here's a three leaf propeller. So in this MBT domain, L3, MBT, L1, there are three MBT domains. This one reads methyl lysine. The potential binding pocket for the other two actually point in exactly the same direction. As if this sits down on chromatin, reads methyl lysine with this domain, and then is doing something else with these other domains. So this is one of the early kind of mysteries of how these work. And the challenge of picking reading proteins, I, you know, I kind of knew this going into it. Enzymes are easy to work on because if you kill their function, things change. Their substrates go away. Right? You don't see the reaction they did anymore. It stops happening. When you kill a reading protein, a protein that causes protein-protein interactions, it's not nearly as easy to track down what you've changed. So this is one of the kind of challenges in working on this. So after about a year or two, my first postdoc came up with this compound, which was the first small molecule co-crystallized with a methyl lysine binding domain. It's about a five micromolar binder to L3 and BTL1. And all the chemists will recognize that's our conformationally constrained dimethyl lysine mimic. And the reason it's more potent than the hist so histone peptides bind about 20 micromolar, this is about 5 micromolar. We're just burying two more carbons in this cage than you do with dimethyl lysine. And in fact, an interesting SAR point if you make the dimethylated amine here, it has no affinity for this protein, zero. So if you make it look just like dimethyl lysine, this conformational constraint doesn't work at all. So you actually have to discover the pyrrolidine first and then make it conformationally constrained. But this compound wasn't potent enough to have cellular activity or we haven't been able to show any. So one of my favorite tricks is if the target I'm working on doesn't like what I'm doing, I just switch targets. So we switched to 53BP1, which has two binding domains. It binds dimethyl lysine and an adjacent arginine. And we started making dibasic compounds that had two copies of this methyl lysine mimic. And lo and behold, this compound was a 300 nanomolar binder to actually another MBT protein. So it's only still five micromolar against 53BP1, which is what we designed it for. But because we cross-screen everything, we stumbled across kind of a, a nanomolar hit for L3 and BTL3. And that's the protein I'm going to talk about for the next 10 minutes, perhaps. Um, so one of the first things we did, we were curious how this is bonding. It has two lysine mimics. So one hypothesis might be maybe more than one of these domains does get involved. But the compound's not big enough to stretch from this domain that is where it binds to one of these other domains. It's not that size. But when we made site-directed mutants in these pockets, if we mutate this, this cognate methyl lysine reading pocket, we completely eliminate binding by ITC. So wild type's 120 nanomolar, nice curve there. Mutate that aspartic acid, you get no binding. If you mutate this aspartic acid, you greatly, you go back to kind of a five, three to five micromolar binder. So this domain, is playing a role in the recognition of the small molecule. When we made the same mutation in domain three, the protein was insoluble, so we don't really know what that does. Um, so now we were very curious, so why does this domain have a function in the binding of that compound? So working with the Structural Genomics Consortium that are our key collaborators in this area, we determined the co-crystal structure of UNC, what's UNC 1215, with L3 and BTL3, and actually, it's a dimer of dimers. So two of the small molecules 
are sandwiched between two L3 and BTL3s. And when we look, the reason it matters to have a mutation in this pocket is that one of our methylysine mimics binds in this pocket of one protein, and the other one binds in domain one of the counter protein in the crystal structure. This is not just an artifact of crystallization. This is what happens in solution. In fact, L3 and BTL3 is a 95 to 5 mixture of dimer and monomer in solution. When you throw the small molecule in, it's 100% dimerized. So the real question is, is this how this thing is reading chromatin, right? So we've made a small molecule, potent ligand. What does this binding mode have to do with what L3 does in vivo? And I'll spend a few minutes trying to convince you that maybe this is how the protein works on chromatin. So one of the assays we do immediately with readers, because as I said, with the, we can't like knock out the enzyme and look for the, the post-translational modification to disappear. Um, we look at localization. So if we GFP tag L3 and BTL3, we can, and it, it forms these foci on chromatin, and when we titrate in compound, we can eliminate those foci. And we have a control compound that if you just make the pyrrolidine ring one carbon bigger, it doesn't bind at all to the MBT proteins, and you see it has no effect on foci. Well, that's, the, that's this construct, so just the MBT domains. When we put in the full-length protein that has all these other recognition domains, the compounds do not abrogate foci formation. So compounds work with this construct. They don't relocalize this construct. We can measure an IC50 against this truncated version, and we're about 500 nanomolar, which is consistent kind of with the activity we get by ITC. And we can mutate these pockets, and actually mutation in the pockets phenocopies the action of the small molecule. So we mutate this pocket, we completely eliminate foci. When we mutate that second pocket, we greatly attenuate foci formation, which is a piece of circumstantial evidence that when this is recognizing chromatin, it's using that domain for something. When we use a different technique called uh, fluorescence polarization after photo, uh, fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching, FRAP, um, we actually see activity against both forms of the protein. So the mobility of the protein, change, the small molecule does change the mobility of the protein. So it won't abrogate foci, but it does make the full length protein more mobile on chromatin. So some evidence that the compound does get to the protein in cells. But we wanted to prove that, and to do that we attached a fluorescent dye to our small molecule. So this is a cell permeable marasine and dye that uh, Chris McNevin, who's a joint postdoc with my group and Klaus Hahn, uh, designed. So this will penetrate cells. And with that, we can look at GFP tagged full length um, L3 and BTL3, and you see right away the, the marasine and dye is exactly where the protein is. So the small molecule is going to the protein in the cell. Even in the full length form, it's fully accessible and they, they co stain. And mutations, I won't go through that, block exactly the same function. So one of the things I mentioned earlier in the kinase talk is selectivity is important. It's especially important for chemical probes. Because the idea of a chemical probe is that if you put it on cells, you're asking a question about the protein target of interest. So to show that we have some selectivity, we run a small panel of MBT domains, chromo, tutor. These are other methylysine readers. We are quite selective for L3, MBTL3, UNC 1215 is 40 <clears throat> nanomolar in this alpha screen type assay and you know, reasonably selective against these other readers, but that's a small set of the 200 readers in the genome. So one of the things we did then was make a bio-10 tagged version of UNC-1215, and in collaboration with Mark Bedford's lab, uh, Mark can express 200 reader domains and put them on a nitrocellulose membrane. And we can just ask, out of the 200 methylysine readers, where does this bio version of our probe bind? And it bound to all of these readers, so we made all of these, made all these proteins, and measured their interaction by ITC with the small molecule, and the closest one is 5 micromolar, which is this PHF20 tutor domain. So we're 100 nanomolar against L3, 5 micromolar against this. So I think we've done a reasonable job within the methyl lysine family of saying this is a selective small molecule. Um, the other thing we've checked for is uh, effects at other. So it's possible these lysine mimics would inhibit uh, protein lysine methyltransferases, histomethyltransferases, and we've tested against all of those. We've tested in Brian Rolfe's group. So 
We're non-toxic in cell titer glow up to 100 micromolars, so we think we've discovered a reasonable chemical probe for this protein L3 and BTL3. But to quote all the students, you can use this to your thesis committee from Bertrand Russell, who said, and all scientists should know this, when one admits that nothing is certain, one must also admit that some things are much more nearly certain than others. So the thing about selectivity is you can never prove that all actions of your compound are from your favorite target, the one you've been working on. Because the small molecule can associate with whatever it likes. It can have an active nightlife that you will be unaware of. So you can only do as good as Bertrand Russell and be nearly certain that the activity of this compound is coming from its action at L3 and BTL3. So with that, you know, um, in terms of quality chemical probes, I feel like with this compound, we've done a good job. It's the first chemical probe for methyl lysine reader. And I will tick off all of these things that we've done. Molecular profiling mechanism of action. We know the active species is stable in cell lysates. We make it freely available. The thing we struggled with is proven utility as a probe. And I, I'm not going to go through the slides where we've worked on that given the time. Uh, but I will just say, Unlike in the protein, so in the protein kinase inhibitor, because we want to get a compound to patients, we have patented the compounds, and we do share them under an MTA with people that want them, but we have protected the intellectual property, because there is no other way that I know of to get a compound to the clinic. With chemical probes, though, we don't create any intellectual property, so we don't patent any of these things. Clearly, we don't have a clue of what, we've got a few clues of what this protein does. But the point of this effort is to make tools freely available to the academic community to increased scientific understanding in this area. So this is just a list of the few investigators that we've shared UNC 1215 with. Lots of people are beginning to be interested in methyl lysine readers because these readers of acetylated lysine, bromo domains, are now in the clinic. Um, so we hope the next few years this sort of proven utility of a probe problem will be cracked with this small molecule. And Lindsay Ingerman, who was a postdoc in the center that stayed on as a research faculty, was lucky to get that on the cover of Nature Chemical Biology back in March. Um, and as I said, I think I will skip through all the other little things we're doing with this uh, reagent. We're, well, I'll stop there. We are tagging. We can make covalent versions of this that tag the protein, which is interesting to us to track function of the protein endogenously. But I think as a chemist, you know, the thing to do is get your probe and then make a toolkit around it that can help you explore the biology. So with that, I'll just acknowledge, I already acknowledged earlier the folks that we worked with on the Murakani's project. It's really been a delight. Um, in the Cromanton area, uh, we work heavily with the Structural Genomics Consortium. That's Cheryl Aerosmith's lab. Um, and they've done all the crystal structures and some of the assays with us. I mentioned Bark Bedford's work in terms of profiling for selectivity. Um, Orgazani also has worked with us on some other projects, and we've been fortunate to get uh, some NIH funding for this effort. And um, I've mentioned Lindsay Ingerman James, who was the key driver behind this L3 and BTL3 chemical probe. So I will wrap up there and be happy to answer any questions. Questions? So you're, the second part of your talk, you're distributing the molecules to various laboratories, and do you require some sort of feedback, or for just kind of? No, if you write and say, yeah, if you write and say, I'd like 10 milligrams, we just send it to you. I feel like people who are open and collaborative, if they find something interesting, they would naturally get in touch with us because we've got some insight into the problems. Um, but we also make it available through Sigma Aldrich. So the first kind of, as soon as we had it as a chemical probe, uh, you could buy it from Sigma Aldrich. We gave them the first few hundred milligrams. You could just get it from the catalog, and now they make it and supply it. So we do that with all our chromatin probes. I started it off. Broke the ice. Sure. So your bio pack, you had this long uh, uh, polynuclear chain. Yeah. You usually do that for solubility. Right. The molecule is quite soluble. Why do you do that? Yeah, it is soluble. I guess, so we didn't do a lot of experiments optimizing, but the lore is just to get it far enough away from the protein that you're not 
that your tag doesn't interfere with the protein's function in any way or that you don't have an association. Sometimes the dyes that you, dyes that you put on, biotin maybe not, but dyes that you put on with a linker, you're worried about a hydrophobic interaction with the protein. So that was just the linker we used and it works and yeah, it's soluble, but we didn't need it for solubility, you're right. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, if, if, if it didn't cost money, I would do it kind of at the hit stage or, well, let's say, I mean, I hit. Or, or as I went into hit the lead and improved potency against my desired target to the nanomolar level, I would want to check because often that's the profile you're going to end up with. It's sometimes not trivial to tune out a lot of the kinome. Because it's very expensive, so it's, you know, so that panel of IC50s is like $8,000. Um, you really don't do it, we don't do it until we get a compound with good PK. <clears throat> Just because that's the point where you know you're really interested in the compound. It's not, it would be nice to know earlier sometimes. Yeah, yeah. $10. Matt, you got a question? Uh, have you found that you can usually add biotin or a dye to a small molecule without problems, build a kind of probe that's attracted in cells? Or is that kind of a hurdle that you have to kind of keep coming back to with each, each probe that you look at and kind of design something new? Because most of these were structurally enabled, we kind of, we know what parts of the small molecule are interacting with, so we, we know where we can tag and not interfere with the bonding activity. We always confirm it as well, so we'll take our biotinylated version and measure the ITC to be sure it's the same. So it's um, a little bit of optimization, but it usually, usually you get to a tool pretty, in a couple of iterations. Yeah. Any other questions? I want to remind everybody this fantastic talk is just the first part of the afternoon. The second part is a poster session where I've been assured we have refreshments and I'm, I know all the students and postdocs have much to do in the lab and please don't partake and, and skedaddle, stay, interact, interact with different people, talk to the speaker. This is our time to be a community that's all interested in drug discovery. And on that note, I'd like to thank Stephen for just an absolute fantastic seminar.